Good morning, and thank you very much for joining this, uh, for a uh, update on Avid's host production products hosted by Atomize. And uh, thank you very much to Ray Thompson from Avid, as uh, Senior Director of Marketing and Partners, uh, for joining us today to uh, run through the overview. And we'll also have um, Atomize's own Andy Wild running through some demonstrations. So during the, um, the presentation, we are using the question and answer feature. We'll be keeping an eye on that and feel free to use it. Let us know what you'd like to, uh, to know and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions. This presentation will be available for uh, uh, live view later. Um, so feel free to share it out. And uh, if you've got any questions afterwards, feel free to get in touch. But uh, I'll hand over to Ray. Thank you very much, all yours. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. And thank you, Adamize, for allowing Avid to present today. And thank you all for taking the time to join us, both in the Zoom and across uh, social media channels we're broadcasting to now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you through some uh, very short market context that we're seeing, uh, walk you through uh, some of the highlights of what's new for Media Composer, Editorial Management, and Nexus. Andy will then jump in and do a live demo of Media Composer and Nexus. And then I will touch on a few other uh, things that are new at Avid around editorial, uh, sorry, excuse me, Edit On Demand and on uh, some remote tool sets that you can take advantage of. Uh, and then we'll do some questions at the end. So feel free to type any questions in the chat and we'll get to those certainly uh, at the end. So uh, just not long ago, Avid had its voice of the customer meetings and some of the key things that we heard from customers coming out of that session, which is really made up of a very broad and large group of Avid users from across multiple different uh, verticals within our vertical, if you will. Um, and these are really some of the main uh, things that they sort of uh, brought to the forefront in terms of observations and things that have changed the way they're thinking about both operations and economics when it comes to running their media business. And certainly COVID, uh, first and foremost, uh, all, of, all of the different uh, groups uh, admitted that COVID really changed uh, how they think about remote uh, access and remote working. Uh, basically, it's very effective and uh, it's been very effective throughout the pandemic. And a lot of that is leveraging, quite honestly, existing technologies that have been around for quite some time, but were re never really pressed into service the way in which they had to be during the lockdowns. Working from anywhere certainly uh, so, uh, solidified security in terms of table stakes, uh, meaning people are thinking more and more about having a secure environment now that everyone is really distributed in terms of where they're working. Uh, the choice of deployment models in terms of on-prem versus cloud versus hybrid, uh, all of that has sort of accelerated. So as people are thinking uh, about uh, how things are gonna be going forward, depending on what region you're in, uh, certainly moving to the cloud has become uh, one of the key things in terms of business continuity. Uh, you know, God forbid this should ever happen again, um, but also uh, in terms of just uh, being able to enable a broader uh, workforce to work from anywhere. Users uh, certainly are migrating more towards um, OpEx away from CapEx. Again, that's another trend that we've seen and uh, the customers certainly validated that that's uh, the direction they're heading. Basically moving towards as, as a service type offerings, being able to spin things up, spin things down and or pay for things over time as a subscription as opposed to uh, big upfront capital investments and then all the uh, sort of resources required to manage that. Working from anywhere, of course, uh, is critical nowadays. Uh, you know, certainly remote working had one definition uh, about a year and a half ago, and now it uh, it has a different one. Collaborated collaborative tools and being able to uh, enable collaboration uh, is critical. So, what here what's here today is great. So, being able to build upon upon that going forward is critical. And then just knowing that this the uh, distributed workforce is sort of the new norm, right? Um, that's how coming out of the pandemic, uh, people are going to continue to work and it's really going to change the way in which people, as I said, run uh, their business both operationally and economically. When you look at the post-production pipeline, Avid certainly plays a prominent role uh, in a variety of different aspects. And, and pre-pandemic, when you thought about sort of the tool sets that Avid brought to bear, it was really focused around collaborative working within the facility while at the same time enabling remote access and extending capabilities into the cloud. So you had uh, sort of a move in the industry pre-pandemic to exploring moving different parts of the workflow into the cloud to realize greater efficiencies, 
uh, while at the same time really investigating how we could enable greater uh, work from sort of anywhere type workflows. Um, and then basically collapsing some of the sort of what in the past were very linear uh, workflows into more uh, workflows that were happening all at once um, and doing so remotely. And so that, that was sort of where the emphasis was uh, before the pandemic. After the pandemic, certainly the world changed and everybody started working primarily from home. Uh, and that became a requirement again, uh, due to the lockdown. And again, going back to what some of our customers told us, you know, the, the fact that you could work from home and do so very effectively was really uh, sort of powerful. Uh, and it opened up the eyes of a lot of different businesses that, you know, maybe you don't need as much space um, and, and maybe you don't need everybody coming to an on-prem environment, but rather people can actually work from home and, uh, and deliver content and in many ways do collaboration just as they would if they were all sitting together in, under the same roof. And so that's one of the big uh, learning uh, learnings that came out of the pandemic. And again, we're leveraging a lot of the technologies that existed, virtualized environments, uh, PCOIP technologies to securely access media composers running in an on-prem environment from home. Some people even turned to the cloud, which we'll talk a little bit about at the tail end. But for the most part, people really were able to pivot and pivot very quickly um, in order to maintain that business continuity. And now what they wanna do is looking forward is really expand those capabilities rethink how they're sort of running their business on a day-to-day -day basis and really shrink their overall footprint. Um, and at the same time, uh, do more uh, and do more with a really a, a, a limitless amount of resources now that they have available since more and more folks can access these tool sets, either running on-prem or in the cloud from pretty much anywhere. So what does this mean going forward in terms of work from anywhere? And, and what are some of the key tenants of what Avid is bringing to the table around work from anywhere as it relates specifically to the post uh, pipeline. Specifically, what we're looking at is, of course, Media Composer and Media Composer remote bins, basically allowing through editorial management users to create things like uh, bins inside of a browser and then being able to do a lot of the prep work uh, that the editor needs to be done prior to ever touching uh, the content and, and doing so with multiple different folks working on the same content at the same time. One of the other areas that's critical to enabling that type of workflow is proxy. And so one of the things you're gonna see a lot more of coming from Avid is around proxy-based workflows, not just inside of editorial management, but certainly inside of Media Composer. So you're gonna be learning a lot more about what's coming uh, soon around proxy and proxy-based workflows. And then you have uh, Nexus Sync, which is being able to not only sync uh, Nexus from on-prem environments into the cloud, but also syncing across different sites. And so that's another area where it's absolutely critical. So as uh, more and more businesses start to adopt cloud-based deployed uh, solutions for various different components in the post pipeline, they're uh, basically realizing they need to have a synced environment so that regardless of where the content lives, I'm accessing that content either via Media Composer, a third-party tool set like Adobe, or even uh, editorial management, and I'm doing so, uh, and, and I wanna be able to find that content. And it really doesn't matter whether that content's sitting on-prem or in the cloud, I just wanna be able to find it use it and do my job. And then certainly have a resilient Nexus client. And so again, these are some of the things that we're thinking about and or working on today, which means we're basically making it easier uh, to basically connect uh, using sort of edge-like devices out there uh, for Nexus to be able to make storing content and accessing content locally, even working from home, even more efficient than it already is. So when you look at Media Composer uh, and you kind of look at some of the key things that are new, uh, going all the way back even to 2019, certainly some of the bigger things that you probably already heard about around things like the new UI, which is a user definable UI, uh, certainly changed the look and feel of Media Composer. And more and more folks are not only getting used to the new user interface, but they're embracing it and actually realizing how much more powerful it actually is, as opposed to some of the older versions. And just as a note, one of the things, if you're on the older 2018.12.x type uh, Media Composer, you want to start thinking about moving forward because we're coming up to the end of uh, support for that at the tail end of this year. Um, the other key thing that certainly Media Composer has been known for for a long time is offline editing, but we're also now uh, with the new UME and uh, the new 32-bit float color uh, pipeline are now uh, venturing into uh, Avid Media Composer as a finishing tool. And so we're finding that more and more folks are adopting Avid as a complete end-to-end -end solution all in one system. So the universal media engine certainly allows for faster and broader workflows with bigger support and broader support for more and more formats, which is one of the 
key tenets of the UME. The other thing is uh, being able to, to basically link to content regardless of where it sits uh, within the environment. Uh, and, and again, supporting more and more codecs and formats. Finishing with the ability to support HDR and certainly 32-bit uh, color flo floating point pipelines, enabling ACEs and, uh, and color correction type workflows. And then mastering and delivery. So adopting industry standards like IMF, DPX and EXR for making delivery to say OTT platforms like Netflix uh, much easier and giving them the flexibility they need to localize content much easier. We're also looking at things like distributed processing and building on what we've already delivered to accelerate things like encoding, as well as accelerating things like mix downs and rendering of effects and, uh, and certainly graphics and using uh, uh, idle CPUs that are available on the network to make that fast. Collaboration certainly is always important. And again, the added work from anywhere components uh, have only accelerated and exacerbated the need for better collaboration tools to allow folks to work from anywhere in a much more collaborative way. And then certainly, you know, you can't think, uh, forget about things like uh, sound, right? And certainly Avid and Pro Tools are stalwart in the industry and have been for a long time. So looking at how we make those two pieces and tool sets even more integrated than they are today. So the uh, uh, nonlinear editing of choice uh, for most uh, uh, folks, certainly in the movie business, of course, um, is Media Composer. And it's become the standard and has been for a long time. And really with the new uh, user interface, it's giving you much more flexibility in terms of how you design your workspace. It's giving you much more flexibility in terms of the amount of different codecs and formats you can work with. And certainly uh, there's a lot of flexibility around how you can now license the tool set, which we'll see in a moment. So being able to have uh, all that flexibility and all that power uh, is only uh, being more and more, uh, you know, enhanced by these new versions. In terms of uh, sort of awards and accolades, certainly Avid's been around for 30 years and more, um, and we've won multiple Oscars and so on. Uh, all of them are technical Oscars, uh, sort of touting and showing some of the innovation that has continued over the years at Avid, including lots of patents. I think we have over 150 patents as a company. Um, and again, we continue to innovate and add to that. And uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, you look at some of these tool sets, you sort of take for granted how much um, uh, ingenuity and how much uh, has happened over the years. And like I said, it's only accelerating as we move into these distributed workflows and cloud workflows. Uh, certainly the user interface, again, one of the bigger uh, uh, components that were added in the 19 version that has only uh, been enhanced since, which is the UI, build a canvas for uh, your most creative uh, use cases. So that allows you to basically customize your workspace and whether you're working on a small laptop or you have a multiple screen setup, you can basically customize that look and feel so that it adopts to the types of workflows you like to do. Um, the other fact that uh, you can move different uh, components around inside the UI makes it easier to learn and use. Um, certainly offline tool sets uh, that are available in terms of uh, uh, what, what allows you to basically work smarter and certainly not harder. Uh, so things like being able to easily navigate uh, projects, bins and timelines, being able to search for content, things like phonetic search and, uh, and script sync, which are unique to Avid, which allow you to basically find content very easily, typing in a word or phrase and taking you right to that moment in that clip so that you can basically take that clip and edit it very easily into your timeline. These are all things that are uh, you know, enhancements uh, building on the 30 years of heritage within the nonlinear editing tool, Media Composer. And then the UME, which is uh, not only, uh, again, adopting uh, more and more in terms of format support, but it's also allowing you to work with more media, both in terms of bringing content in and then exporting content out. So for example, we are, uh, you know, most, most recently added uh, the ability to support things like MP4s, uh, certainly work uh, very well with PNGs, TIFFs, JPEGs, and EXR image sequences. <clears throat> and the ability to output things like H.264 and ProRes RAW are all new features that are in the UME. In terms of uh, finishing, uh, you know, we are again uh, with the third two point color flo uh, floating point uh, of color pipeline. Uh, we are now able to support ACES workflows, which means we're able to work with high resolutions um, and doing things like HDR. Certainly there's a, a bunch of trade-offs around being able to work uh, with the different formats, whether it's 4K, uh, 8K or more. Uh, you know, the industry seems to always continue to move more and more in terms of uh, resolutions and, and certainly bit rates. Um, and certainly then there's the, the ability to take advantage of HDR, uh, which is, is again, one of the uh, key things when it comes to uh, ingesting and, and working with different content. 
IMF packages. Um, again, this is for delivering content uh, to primarily uh, OTT type providers and platforms and being able to do so and giving them the flexibility to then localize that content uh, across the board using those same packages. So this is becoming more and more important in the industry as these OTT platform providers become uh, more and more uh, ubiquitous and, uh, and more and more popular. Certainly during the pandemic, we saw an increase in the amount of folks who were subscribing to these services. It actually spiked quite a bit and it was already uh, off the charts before the pandemic. So, uh, you know, it's becoming more and more important as, uh, as people rely more and more on OTT platforms for their entertainment. The other key thing here that uh, is important is distributed processing. So with distributed processing, you can basically leverage idle CPUs on the network to do a variety of different things like, uh, you know, rendering uh, timelines and sequences, certainly doing mix downs for audio, uh, and of course, rendering things like titles and graphics and doing so very fast by, uh, by leveraging distributed processing. And then there's a whole bunch of new tool sets that you'll start to see uh, to be able to better manage those jobs as they happen across the network using distributed processing, taking more advantage of, of the server that, uh, that you need in order to run distributed processing. So there's a lot of things that are happening and coming there. Media Composer Enterprise is, is really uh, starting to become a huge success for Avid. Uh, more and more folks are adopting it because of the many benefits that it provides. Uh, certainly one of the key things around Enterprise is the ability to customize uh, roles and responsibilities within uh, the tool set to make it not only easier to learn, but also uh, to sort of protect content uh, so that folks who shouldn't have access to things like reads or writes uh, uh, and, and have the ability to delete content, for example, don't have those rights, uh, while at the same time um, providing the flexibility needed in order to support all the different roles throughout the different uh, workflow, whatever workflow you're currently employing. Um, and so the other key thing about Media Composer Enterprise, it comes with uh, Cloud VM, which is basically uh, allowing you uh, to take advantage of all the virtualization capabilities uh, that are now possible and have been for, for quite a while. And again, that's one of the key things that folks took advantage of, certainly during the pandemic. We have a great partnership with Teradici to allow you to access Media Composer running uh, on-prem from anywhere using a thin client. Um, and we also uh, uh, work very well with uh, HP RGS as well. Um, so that, those are just some of the some of the tool sets that folks are taking advantage of today to access on-prem environments. And then of course, you know, uh, we we have seen again a a, a real shift to, in in the market to as a service type uh, offerings and really uh, uh, embracing um, opex and moving away from capex uh, as folks uh, really. Uh, start to look at things in a different light, right, as a net result of the pandemic. And again, that that is uh, both an accelerated move to the cloud, as well as adopting and embracing uh, sort of subscription-based offerings uh, throughout the tool sets. And uh, we only see that accelerating, and it's a big part of, of uh, the move in the industry, and it's a big part of Avid's business. The other big thing that folks are asking for is the ability to do some remote monitoring from home. So this has been uh, a big challenge, right, is being able to look at the output of a media composer on a, on a monitor um, in the highest resolution possible, at the highest bit rate. And so we've been uh, implementing SRT uh, across the tool sets within Avid. SRT, if you're not familiar, is an open source protocol that was created by High Vision, and they have uh, basically um, enabled anyone to adopt SRT and build it into either encoders, cameras, uh, mobile devices, apps, you name it. And so it has been adopted by over 450 companies uh, within the industry. And basically it allows you to deliver securely over standard internet from anywhere to anywhere. So either from a single point to multiple points at the same time, or from a point to point, uh, or from multiple points to multiple destinations. Um, and so it's really a very flexible protocol. And essentially today you can go SDI out of a DNX uh, system into a Mikido, Mikido X4 encoder and send SRT to any one of the devices that you see there on the right, a uh, set-top box, uh, a decoder, or use the SRT free app to play on a mobile device, uh, or use the VLC player to play back content uh, using the SRT plugin for VLC. Both those bottom options are free options, and what that provides you is an amazing amount of flexibility when it comes to monitoring and looking at content from pretty much anywhere. There are even options out there that will allow you to uh, view content, leveraging SRT on even uh, your uh, Amazon Prime uh, setup and or uh, on an uh, Apple TV. 
So we're finding this is becoming very important for users as it relates to being able to look at third monitor um, either at home or at some other remote location. And so this provides you with that flexibility. So when you look at the uh, lineup of Media Composer, we have certainly uh, all different options for users, everything from Media Composer First, which is our free option for folks who wanna start out and learn Media Composer all the way up and through Media Composer Enterprise, which gives you everything uh, Avid brings to the bear as it relates to Media Composer. So Symphony, Script Sync, Phrase Find, News Cutter, and Cloud VM. And then these are some of the other different monitoring options uh, that allow you to basically monitor content both on-prem and then as you saw in the prior slide, you can come uh, SDI out of any one of those devices and go uh, into a Keto and send SRT for monitoring at home. All right, when you look at editorial management, uh, last year at the tail end of the year, we launched 2020.11, which included things like the Adobe Premiere uh, integration. So Avid uh, now has a panel inside of Adobe Premiere Pro that allows you to basically uh, use editorial management. So you can search for and find content, you can uh, create a sequence, you can create a project or a bin for Adobe Premiere right within editorial management, all of which uh, is possible today in the shipping version. Um, we also had several different tool set improvements, including support for span media. We had uh, the ability to create group clip, excuse me, group group clips uh, based on uh, start time code and an improved handling of additional Media Composer complex sequences. So uh, you're able to play some complex uh, Media Composer sequences inside of editorial management. And that's only going to further be enhanced as we roll out more and more versions. Uh, there are now subscription-based op options for folks who want to adopt uh, editorial management. And then we've made it easier to deploy uh, as well. So what are some of the things folks have been asking us to improve upon? And what you what can you look forward to in 2021? So one of the big things was you know the server is uh, somewhat expensive given the amount of uh, sort of uh, functions that it delivers. And so one of the things you're going to start to see coming from us is that same server doing more and more, not just uh, some of what I just talked about around distributed processing, but certainly there'll be a lot of other services you'll be able to run. Uh, that will really allow you to sort of maximize that investment. Um, certainly installation, uh, we're always striving to make installation of editorial management even easier. And so you'll see some movement there this year. Uh, enabling work from anywhere, certainly editorial management is an important tool. Browser-based access to your content sitting on Nexus, the ability to create um, bins uh, for Media Composer and or uh, creating projects for uh, Adobe Premiere, all, all using uh, you know the editorial management browser-based tool set. So, we're, we're continuing to build out your ability to access and do work uh, collaboratively from, from pretty much anywhere. Um, deep integration, of course, with Media Composer. So you also have the panel for editorial management sitting inside of Media Composer, which again, gives you access to all the media that's sitting on your Nexus. And then I'm giving you that drag and drop capability right from within the editorial management window inside of Media Composer. So you can quickly search for and find content based on uh, either powerful metadata searches or phonetic search, which is also an, an available option inside of editorial management. And then you can drag and drop that content right into your Media Composer project that you're working on. Certainly scale, scalability is important. So uh, we had uh, many folks ask for us to scale from 25 seats. So certainly today the limit is 25 seats, but you'll see some movement there as well in terms of being able to scale and support more clients sitting on the network. And then last but certainly not least, adding more features and functionality to the tool set itself so that you can do uh, a lot more uh, within uh, editorial management while at the same time uh, maximizing that integration uh, and enhancing its abilities as it relates to both Media Composer and uh, Adobe. So what does that really start to look like? Well, you have uh, sort of this proxy-based capability that you'll be hearing more about um, that'll basically allow you to do uh, uh, proxy-based workflows, both with the browser and inside of Media Composer. That's gonna add a whole bunch of flexibility. It'll also increase the amount of uh, uh, basically streams you can uh, handle uh, with that same server. You'll have uh, interactive Nexus clients, uh, which is basically providing you that, that sort of Nexus connectivity uh, between the clients sitting at home and certainly the Nexus sitting on-prem. You'll have bin management uh, and collaboration. So you'll have greater improvements that you'll start to see there this year. You'll have the proxy uh, generation capabilities baked into distributed processing among a whole host of other things that you're gonna start to see that'll be available. Just expanding what was released last year around distributed processing, taking advantage of idle CPUs in the network 
work. And then you'll have a, a much easier all-in-one installer um, that you'll be able to do installations with. You'll have uh, the ability to connect Adobe and Media Composer uh, clients all on the same network. Um, and again, you can do a lot today uh, uh, in terms of having a mixed environment, either Media Composer and Adobe sitting on Nexus, or you can have an all Adobe set up as well, all sitting on Nexus, all taking advantage of the integration work that was done last year and rolled out uh, last year and this year. And then certainly uh, the ability to browse, search for, and find content quickly, easily, all the way down to using phonetic search where you can find a word or phrase uh, and basically see that actual word spoken inside of any clip uh, based on uh, on that phonetic search. So uh, pretty powerful tool set, and you're going to see a lot of enhancements all within editorial management coming uh, this year. And then, of course, uh, there's Avid Nexus, which is the backbone of all of it. Um, and at the end of the day, Avid has a long and, and rich heritage of delivering powerful collaborative storage tool sets to the industry, going all the way back to the mid-90s and the Unity platform, and then evolving into ISIS, and then ultimately now Nexus, a scalable high-performance storage setup uh, that basically gives you multiple different options from SSDs uh, to online and even nearline and now cloud-based options uh, to basically extend your storage system out into the cloud easily all managed using the very familiar browser-based uh, UI that is the Nexus uh, Management Console, um, all secure uh, with flexible work workspace permissions, um, strong protection, uh, certainly fully redundant with no single point of failure throughout the device. Um, and then, uh, like I said, deployment flexibility, either running it on-prem or in the cloud. And then tiered storage management, being able to tier your different storage options. So as you grow as a business, um, you have options to basically grow your storage to manage that business. So this is kind of what the lineup looks like today. Tier one, uh, sorry, tier zero flash tier. So SSDs, the Nexus C2. This is ideal for online finishing, conform and dailies. And now that Media Composer can do all of this rich work around things like uh, finishing and, uh, and uh, certainly 32 bit color point, uh, floating point rather, uh, color correction and things like that. Now uh, can take advantage of the SSD capabilities. Then you have the uh, online tier, and then of course the nearline tier, which allows you to basically extend uh, the file system to a nearline option, but allows you to have a very dense uh, sort of storage so solution for storing long-term projects and project parking. And then of course you have uh, the ability to then extend into cloud spaces, all again managed using uh, the very familiar Avid uh, <clears throat> Nexus workspace management tool set through the browser. Uh, and you can easily scale that up uh, very simply using the, the interface. Um, and then Avid Nexus Cloud, which you may be scratching your head saying, what is Avid Nexus Cloud? Well, basically Edit On Demand is leveraging all the work that was done between Avid and Microsoft to integrate the Nexus file system very deeply into the Azure Blob storage stack. So this was not a lift and shift of Nexus into the cloud, but rather a very deep integration. And that's really what that's referring to. And so you're gonna to start to see more SaaS offerings as well as more customized deployment options uh, from the cloud team around Avid Nexus. And a lot of that is benefiting from uh, all the good work that was done there. So when you think about sort of uh, the storage solutions and sort of some of the key things that we're supporting, we have all of this support, uh, not just for Avid tool sets, of course, right? But you have Adobe Premiere Pro, you have Final Cut, you have Blackmagic and DaVinci Resolve, Autodesk Flame, all of which can take advantage of uh, Avid Nexus, all sitting in the same network, all working together, uh, you know, in a very collaborative way. Then you have Edit Avid Edit On Demand, which I just referenced, and I'll talk a little bit more later, but basically this is editorial in the cloud, spin it up. It does all the auto provisioning of the cloud resources needed in order to run the environment. And then you use it for as long as you need to, even scaling as the project grows bigger. And then when you're done, you basically uh, take down your, your assets and or uh, bins, and, uh, and projects, and then basically uh, you're, you're done using, paying only for what you use during the time in which you had that project. And then, like I said, Avid Nexus Cloud, which is really taking advantage of uh, the work that was done early on in the Avid Microsoft relationship, doing that deep integration between the Nexus file system and Azure Blob Storage. So very quickly, what's new uh, in Nexus? You have certainly folder level uh, permissions. So there's an API now that exposes those uh, to the user interface. You also have larger capacity media packs, basically higher density in the same footprint, allowing to basically store more, uh, in, like I said, in the same footprint. And then uh, you have expanded support for finishing workflows, including support for things like Autodesk Flame, all sitting on the same Nexus file system. You have uh, all mirror engines, which you may or may not have heard of. Essentially, this is a lower cost 
uh, Nexus system that basically allows you to mirror your environment for disaster recovery purposes so that no matter what, um, you will not lose your media. Um, and so this is a great option uh, and it's a lower cost option in order to allow you to sort of, again, have a mirrored environment in the event of a catastrophic failure. And then you have uh, Nexus Cloud Spaces, which we rolled out a couple of years ago. And this is an easy way to extend the Nexus file system, allowing you to basically push workspaces into the cloud very easily um, and accessible uh, and, and basically manageable all from the same UI. And then you have the file gateway, <laughs> which is uh, basically allowing you to uh, run on a VM machine with CentOS, basically supporting SMB and client connections. So uh, those are all some of the new things that uh, are there. And then soon you'll be hearing more and more about the sync service, which is gonna allow you to basically sync what you have on-prem to what is happening in the cloud. So I know that's a lot. I know I just threw a lot at you, but uh, it's time for me to sort of hand it over uh, to Andy, who's gonna go ahead and demo um, uh, basically Media Composer, show you some of what I just discussed, uh, and as well as uh, show you what's new with Avid Nexus. So Andy, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Raymond. That's a great kind of setup for me. So I'm just gonna um, share my screen now. So I'm just gonna give you the whole thing in a second. So hopefully you are at the moment seeing the logon for Media Composer. Uh, but you also should be able to see uh, the logon as well for the Nexus uh, tool set as well. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview uh, of some of these components uh, uh, and their functionality and allude to some of the things that Raymond also kind of uh, outlined in his uh, presentation. So it'll be quite short, just kind of touching on the flavor of some of these things. I'll do a very brief kind of tour uh, of, of Nexus uh, and, and then I'll, I'll move on to a MIDI Composer. So, um, I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with Nexus and, and particularly shared storage. Uh, as Raymond said earlier on as well, I would have been in the shared storage, uh, particularly for editorial systems for, for over 20 years now, uh, starting with you know, Unity Media Network, going through ISIS, which fundamentally was a, a big change uh, for us uh, and much easier to adopt because we then moved towards a, an Ethernet based uh, solution, which means that we could deploy into a, a, into a traditional IT infrastructure and allow people to access shared storage in a much more cost-effective manner. Um, and ISIS then ultimately kind of matured into Nexus, which is the next generation uh, of, of ISIS storage, as, it would, as the name would kind of suggest, I suppose. But one of the big changes for that was the fact that we moved away from uh, having a combination of a, an operating system and, a, and, a, and ultimately a web GUI that we also had as well to control uh, and administrate some of it. But behind all that sat uh, um, uh, traditionally a Microsoft uh, operating system that we would uh, interact with as well. Nexus really kind of changed that fundamentally. And what that meant was that we, we literally do everything through a web-based interface. Um, there's no need to kind of interact directly with the operating system. It's completely provisioned uh, through a web browser. So you can see here, uh, this is the traditional login. This is where we'd go into uh, manage and build a system. Uh, we tend to land here, or we always land here on the, on the dashboard, which gives us a good overall view of, of the system's uh, uh, either, either load uh, or functionality. Um, but, but basically this dash page gives me a, a one uh, stop location to see what's going on on my system at the moment. Obviously this is a, a just being used by myself for, for this demonstration. So we're not seeing an awful lot going here. But we can see uh, if we had a number of users and the bandwidth were coming off the system, we can see what we've allocated in this case, we're using on-prem storage because this is uh, uh, physically here within my, my office. And we also get a little bit of information on here about how many media packs, uh, which is basically the storage that we actually have on the system, maybe the host name we just assigned to it. You can also see the version that we're running here. So I'm on the 2021.3 release at the moment. Um, but yeah, much very easy to navigate and very easy to uh, yeah, facilitate. So. Obviously, uh, j just a brief overview for everybody who maybe hasn't seen this before, um, although I would be quite surprised if you haven't. Uh, we basically can provision storage. Storage is workspaces. These are, are, are virtual volumes that are presented to the end user. Uh, I can very easily create them. I can just put the plus icon here. I can then type a name, uh, yet more storage, okay. Mots can't spell today, apologies. Get more storage. Um, there are different levels of protection. So one of the things that is very key around uh, Nexus 
is that we, we are using the software raid protection technology here. Um, and this basically allows us to have multiple uh, workspaces or these virtual volumes that exist within the Nexus, but all those volumes have varying types of protection against them. So you can see here, I can have uh, two disk protection, which is akin to uh, RAID 6. I can also have one disk protection, which is akin to RAID 5, and obviously uh, unprotected. Uh, basically, it's, it becomes like a RAID 0 uh, functionality there. Um, but one of the things that's interesting from my point of view is that uh, we can host all these on literally in, in one particular environment. So I can have a RAID 6 or akin to a RAID 6 and a RAID 5 on the same uh, actual unit. Uh, and there's no there's no issues for us. So you can see here, straightforward. We can we can build build a solution. So we can build a workspace. And there is a thing here called engine protection mode. Uh, I am using the entry level uh, on-prem storage, which is the Avid Nexus Pro. Uh, the Pro is kind of something that I think you would find in most post-production houses. It's very cost-effective. It's very easy to deploy. Like I said before. Uh, but more importantly, it also has a, a, a good balanced number of users. So this particular system here can have uh, 24 concurrent users using the same storage at the same time. We can scale it up to a number of engines, up to four engines. Um, uh, it's much more cost effective. Um, as, as you saw earlier on from Raymond's slide as well, the next step up from that will be a thing called the enterprise engines. These are E2s, E4s, E5s we mentioned earlier on. They offer uh, an enterprise solution. So they offer uh, more users can be attached to systems. Um, disk capacity is also increased as well. And, and a, even a higher availability and re redundancy with multiple controllers uh, can be facilitated within the, en uh, the enterprise systems. But fundamentally, the operation that we see inside here works in exactly the same way. You, you know, if, if I know Nexus Pro, I know any of the other Nexus uh, uh, storage solutions as well. But what I wanted to say was that, that in uh, if you want uh, very high protection, uh, if you're running, you know, petabytes of storage potentially, there is an option to have engine protection mode. We need to have three equal sized uh, engines available. And ultimately what that does, uh, rather than protect against individual disk failure, that uh, protects against entire engine losses. Um, if, if that's a, a, a concern for you as a, as a facility. But this is Nexus Pro, uh, like I say, very, very popular. Um, and found in, in most post houses that, that, uh, that I, I've ever bumped into and worked around. So you can see here, we can assign the users. We can also assign user access in the same way um, we mentioned before. Hit save, this becomes available here. It then says, uh, as far as it's concerned, you can see it here on my single uh, Nexus Pro, I've got one disk and I've also got two disk protection uh, workspaces in the same location. Very straightforward. Um, we can create users as well here, uh, either individual users. So I've got one, Andy one, which is me, uh, and I've got four editors down here as well. And again, very simple to do. Uh, I can hit the add button and I can say, uh, add me. And I, again, can have, uh, I can give temporary passwords as some of these are new functionalities that we, we are also seeing inside the 2021.3 uh, release of Nexus. We, we can assign a temporary password. Uh, which only works for a certain period of time and will force you to change it. Um, we can also then assign here users into a group. So we can obviously in the traditional manner, rather than having a, a, in assigning individual users uh, access to workspaces, which can be quite laborious and tiresome, particularly when you're using or, or, or have a large pool of users, uh, it might be best to assign them into a group. So for example, if I could say, if I want to place them inside this particular group here, they are a member of it. Once I've done this, I can choose OK. Oh, I do need a password. That's a good point. Uh, one of the things was uh, be aware on earlier systems, you could get away with actually having no password whatsoever. Uh, but now we, we are actually, in terms of my appointment, says a password is required. So I will go for my uh, ubiquitous Avid. <laughs> and obviously, I need to kind of verify the password again there. OK, it's fine. Okay, we will not save that. Uh, but there we go. That's my user saved inside here. Um, and obviously, once we created these workspaces, they obviously are then mapped to the system. Uh, and that is done by us uh, installing a client. So here's my client down here. And as you can see, uh, I've got some workspaces uh, that um, uh, I've mapped already. So I've got this classic garden, my demo media. But depending upon the, uh, the volumes that I have available to me, um, which we define within the uh, 
next to this environment, I only see the things that I will have access to. Uh, and obviously those workspaces themselves can be uh, presented to you in a number of manners. They can be either a read-write functionality or they can be a read-only uh, kind of function as well. I'm quite wary of time, so I'll kind of crack on with this. Okay, so once we've actually got our, our Nexus system running, uh, and, it, and Nexus and IC systems have been around for a long time. They have been very robust. They kind of underpin the majority of, uh, so, uh, of post houses that uh, you, will, you will kind of work in or bump into. Um, but let me kind of move over now from the um, from the uh, Nexus and let's me get involved now in the Media Composer. And again, any questions around that, please feel free to throw those into the, uh, the question, the Q&A section. But that's just a very brief overview of the interface of uh, Nexus. And apologies for people who've kind of seen that 100 times before, uh, but just kind of see uh, how easy it is to interact with the system, how easy it is to create workspaces and how easy it is to deploy uh, to end users. So this is uh, Media Composer 2021.5, uh, obviously out relatively recently. Um, and I just wanted to go through, uh, revisit some topics that we, we, we've, we've kind of alluded to before. So the new interface, the UME engines, and these are kind of, uh, these came out relatively, not in the 2021 builds, but we've, we've seen these in 2019 and, and 2020 builds have come out in some of these features. But it's worthwhile kind of touching on them again. I think it's also worthwhile as well reiterating the fact from Raymond, um, 28, the 2018 builds, so 2018.12.x, what it needs to be, uh, of Media Composer is the old familiar interface that people have known probably for the last 15, 20 years plus. So that, that has the traditional floating windows. It's something that everybody is very, very familiar with. In 2019, we saw a refresh of the interface um, and that refresh interface potentially, I don't think it necessarily scared people off, but it was a bit of a kind of, a, oh, this is a bit of a change. How, how, do, I, um, how do I use it? Uh, as we mentioned before, the 2018 build does not have new features released into it. So some of the features I'm going to be showing you here, you will not find in the 2018 builds. Um, more importantly, it does not got any of the new feature sets. So I think so you will not see the, uh, the, um, the IMF uh, tool will not be available to you. Uh, and the, the sync lots to find and replace and the bulk edit, all these things we're going to talk about here, they will not be available inside the 2018. So all the new features, you, you will need to adopt uh, the, new, um, uh, the new builds. Um, I've, I've used, I go back to the early 90s with MIDI Composer. And so I'm very familiar with the old interface, but uh, it, it's no giant leap of faith to, to use the new interface. The new interface is great. We can use it as both floating and non-floating, but we'll, we'll come on to that in just a bit. But what the first thing I wanted to show you, though, was the project window obviously is, is slightly different for most people. Uh, and sometimes they get freaked out by the whole idea that, my gosh, what are all these things, these icons? Be aware you can manipulate this interface. So one, we can just show it as a thumbnail, which is fine. Uh, but I do prefer to see the detail view. You might find the frame window slightly distracting. You can go here. We can go into the choose columns and we can say, hey, I don't want to see the frame. I can then choose OK. And that all of a sudden makes life much easier and we can see all the information that we want to see. And we can control the different columns we want to view here. So color space, frame, raster size. Uh, but more often than not, uh, particularly if you are in a busy uh, uh, facility and you've got lots of projects on the go, I always turn the frame off just because it makes things uh, easier to locate and find as well. OK, so I'm just going to go and uh, choose uh, this guy here. Um, and I'm just going to open the project up. OK, so first of all, this is, um, this is the interface that probably everybody is slightly <laughs> overly concerned about, I would probably say. Um, there is no need to be overly concerned about this. I think it, it's much easier to, um, to use than you would actually think. Uh, I'm just going to hide this bar at the top, it's slightly annoying. Apologies. No, okay. Fine. So um, this is the interface I mentioned to before. One of the things with it is, is this, I, I personally like this. Can you see how I've got some windows that flown up? I personally like this because um, I'm obviously presenting this to you in a on, on a single display for obviously ease of use. Uh, obviously, this would normally be over multiple screens for a lot of people. But the thing that's really good about this is that the floating windows for me 
always were a frustration. I don't know about anybody else. When I was opening bins, I would always make sure I opened them in a, in a shared window, as it were, a master window. Uh, and that, that kind of works in the same way here. It means that you have a more effective and, and a consistent look and layout, as far as I'm concerned. Um, these can be moved around. It's not very difficult to do. You can break them out if you want to. You can put them to different locations. So there, I've just floated that. But I can equally uh, just either place them back in, so you know where I want to go, if I place above or below. Uh, or if you want to, you can just say, well, I don't need this anymore. I'm just going to remove it, and I'll just reposition this guy over here, and that's all fine. So I, I personally have not struggled to adopt this interface, and I, I do strongly recommend anybody who's been a little bit wary of it, I would definitely kind of uh, move towards it, embrace it, see what it goes. Um, there might be a few slight changes and a subtle you know, variations of where you might find things, but ultimately, I think this is a, a much more uh, refined interface and much makes, for me personally anyway, it makes much more sense in, in how it's presented. So um, let's kind of dive into a few little things and details that maybe people have seen before, or maybe not. Um, there's been a, a few, a, a, a lot of changes within bin functionality as well um, of the, the systems. Uh, and one of the things to be aware of is that the bin has, uh, you know, we can we can find things easy. If, I don't know, I'm looking for the word tape. This is actually from tape as well, but I'm not. So I want to find uh, tape 002. Obviously, that then filters these things out here. One of the frustrating things about um, a lot of these search functions, and this used to happen on the old version of the composer, sometimes you would search within the bin, and the bin it shows you the search display. And then, but the frustrating thing is, is that Okay, well, it's fine. It's showing me everything we take two, but, but I wonder how much is left in this particular bit. Well, if you notice down here, which might be difficult for you to see on your Zoom, but it now says viewing 10 of 19. This actually is a, a function that is uh, called the, the status bar. Okay, so normally you wouldn't see anything inside here. This looks to me, if you didn't notice that was actually uh, filtering and showing just a take two, you wouldn't know how many items were in this particular bin. Uh, but if you go right click and then just do a show status bar, much like you get on a, a Windows platform, we obviously see down here that we are viewing 10 of 19 uh, clips as well. So this is great. Uh, it, it also means that um, if I was to remove that particular search there, I'm seeing 19 of 19 shots. And again, you know, bigger and bigger productions, we're now it's not uncommon to find a bin that may well have 100 clips inside them. Um, uh, so yeah, very, very useful. Um, there's lots of things I suppose everybody's familiar with. We can do this where we get the little, uh, the navigation window inside here as well, which is, I think is, is quite cool. Uh, we can make that a little bit, oops, my F, I'm gonna do that now. Um, let me come into here, choose the, uh, just a, a larger for you. So you can see here, it, even if you've got a bin run, I mean, obviously, if I do fill sorted, I'm oh, sorry, all of this. I can basically, it's much, much easier to find things inside here, particularly when you've got lots of, of material inside it. So that basically is an, a way of easy finding content in bins that are particularly full. Um, one of the things, however, that I'm sure that you would normally like to do is uh, do um, much more manipulation around the actual bin content itself. So let's say, for example, uh, if I go and look at uh, here, traditional menus, by the way, you know, we, the old hamburger menu kind of looks the same, we're getting double bars inside here. Uh, but if, uh, if I really want to kind of get involved in, in more advanced things, we should have the option then to do, um, and with my book edit gun. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Right. So one of the things we've got, we, we, I quite like the find and replace function. So one of, this obviously gives the ability to say find something in particular. So uh, take 002. I quite like the idea here as well that, that we now get this highlighting function. So rather than that, I, I use the find to actually find and highlight things purely because I get a, a visual location of finding things much easier. Uh, it, it's, it's a little thing, but I think it's very, very uh, uh, important um, because it actually highlights the shots without actually hiding other shots. So yes, I've got 19 items in the bin, but I can actually find these. And if I wanted to, I could even replace the naming functionality. So well, I don't want to call it a tape 002. 
I want to call it uh, master. Oh, master. Okay, and I can then say, okay, replace that one. So you know, master real six. And I can, or I can just say, that's fine. Uh, just replace them all. So there's there's now all of a sudden a very simple way of, of finding individuals. We can also bulk edit as well items. Um, I don't want to go in too long, so I'm going to run out of time very quickly. Um, but it, it is a very powerful tool. And again, it, it goes on just to further enhance a lot of this functionality uh, inside um, the new Compose system. A few of the little things I do like within the, the, uh, the interface, um, I'm kind of not a chance to really talk about the UME engine that much, but a few of the little enhancements I do like, um, if, I don't know if you notice down here, uh, if I was to say, for example, uh, if I take this audio track here, uh, and, and if I have you know sequences with lots and lots of audio tracks inside them, sometimes inside the mixing tool, it's very hard to find those particular tracks. We've now got a, a, a thing that I love, which is basically going in and we can then change the track color, say to say maybe like blue. If you notice down here in the mixer tool, all of a sudden the actual uh, tracks themselves, we have to get a blue indicator down here. So it means that if I wanted to, I can maybe group uh, uh, different stems and different colors. I mean, it makes life much easier to identify these inside the mix tool as well. So all subtle little differences and variations, uh, but ultimately all kind of go forward to making your life a lot easier in, in both the offline uh, and, and the online process for you as well. Um, just what we're talking about the online as well, if I was to come in here and I just make a, a new bin, go down here, new bin, console, and I right click and I then say input source browser. One of the things that we need to be aware of now is that uh, in my uh, desktop, I think it is, on the desktop, I do have access to some content. So I've got my uh, uh, somebody's moved my content, which is useful. Let's go in here. It's great. So users, uh, editor. Here we go. So I've got some footage down here. So if you notice where this footage is, um, it, the plugin now here actually specifically says the UME link. So this is now using the Universal Media Engine, and this engine is the is the underlying change. So things like even though I'm running this on a Windows platform uh, with the UME engine and its functionality, so it's two-bit floating point, lots of other things, much more extended functionality for accessing H.265 or H.264 uh, content. One of the things that we uh, that we that this also allows us to do is for the first time. Uh, for a long time, actually, if ever. Um, on the PC system, I can now create actually ProRes master files should I want to. So we're no longer limited uh, by having to use a Macintosh to create a ProRes for a final transmission master. We can actually do that completely within uh, on a PC platform as well. So just to show you, this is the UME link function, just a very a quick, I don't know, I'm very conscious of the time. Uh, and also, um, finally, what I want to show you is uh, one more little item might be useful. Let me just do a very quick thing together for you. Um, I'll just look at this content here. Um, quick edit, a hideous edit, we'll do one like that. Um, TX. So we, one of the things we alluded to before, and this was again, a new, new uh, feature that's just come out. This is the uh, IMF uh, function. So now we, we're delivering to OTT services simplifying and streamlining that process is what we're really aiming to do uh, that is a simple tool with the imf window okay the imf window here allows us to do uh, multiple things uh, but more importantly we should be able to kind of uh, drag and drop these deliveries and it says okay for this edit you've made what do you want to do do you want to give an original or a supplemental well i can do uh, an original uh, it then presents this window to me let me just scale it out a little bit bigger so you can see what needs to do um, so here for this particular package, uh, I can name the package as well. So say I call this uh, climbing delivery. I don't need to. Okay. Uh, I now got the option here: application patterns. So uh, what compression profile am I going to do? Level six. What raster size? I'll do this as HD. The color space. And these are obviously all defined ultimately by your final delivery uh, with with their requirements on the top of that. We can do audio mapping as well. 
So I can say map tracks, I can say uh, maybe A1, it's going to be mono, that's fine. I can also add in more. Uh, all tracks are going to be stereo. Um, and, and there's lots of things here. We can also say, well, actually, it's going to be in, in English. Uh, they also, for some insane reason, and I do kind of like this, which is slightly interesting, there is Klingon in here for those who are big into, <laughs> I don't know why, but Klingon's there, I'm not too sure. Anyway, yeah, it's a Klingon. But you can see here, the, this is very important. It streamlines our whole process, it allows us to deliver uh, your final online content. It's pushed straight out as a package. Uh, once we define where it needs to go, I'll, I'll fill in these compliance and just kind of rushing through so I know it's quite close to 10 o'clock. Once you fill all these uh, areas out, if it's red, it means there's more information required. Yellow means there's probably uh, something that's supplementary needs to go inside there. I can specify where it needs to go, hit the export button, it'll build everything, the packages, the, uh, the CPLs, everything will go inside there. And ultimately, we then get our final transmission master. So again, lots of tools to help us to streamline not only the, uh, the user's experience, but also the final delivery packages as well on top. So I'll kind of pass that back now uh, either to Raymond or possibly Richard, I'm not too sure who, and um, I'll stop sharing my screen. But hopefully that was a very, very rushed uh, short delivery, but hopefully I've touched on most major points for everybody. And again, any questions, please do ask. Absolutely. No, that was great. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Well done. And um, I know we're almost out of time. So just, uh, Richard, do you do you want to want to just wrap up or should I uh, and then maybe do a few questions or? Uh, well, certainly if, if you want to do a few questions, but um, I'll just add in, um, I know we've had a very short period of time to do the, to do the demo today. Thank you very much, Andy and, and Ray for, for pushing through so much content. Uh, if anyone would like to see these things in more detail, please feel free to get in touch. We've got all these demo systems uh, uh, in our Wellington office and also in our Auckland office. Feel free to come into the office and see it. We're also happy to do a remote presentation for you one-to-one -one and answer your, your questions directly. So if there's any follow-up questions, just feel free to get in touch. Um, Ray, did we have some questions? Uh, I think we said, uh, saw a question or two come through if you'd like to. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so Dean asked about Teradici on a Mac setup. Um, we'll send him a receiver. So today, I know you can run Teradici on a Mac, um, but you're accessing a Windows uh, system. Um, I have heard that Teradici is close to releasing a version that will run natively on a Mac. Uh, I haven't seen that announcement yet, but I have heard it's coming. Um, so as soon as it does, we will certainly qualify that. Um, uh, can you give us some detail on the UME, please, how it deals with different types of media? So basically, uh, the Avid uh, Unified Media Engine uh, basically expands support for more codecs. Um, it also allows you to link to more media. So for example, more recently, we added things like support for H.264, H.265, both import and export. Um, and those are just two examples. I mean, there's, there's multiple uh, examples. We continuously add more and more codec uh, support uh, through the UME. Um, and we're just trying to basically be as open as possible. And that's really afforded by the UME. That's a lot of the under the hood work that happened. Um, and that's that also feeds as well, Raymond, in the, the fact that we can do like um, uh, like a DPL type workflows yes. as well. So that, that's, I think that's a really important thing that those 32-bit floating point fund, fundamentally was released by the UME. Itself. Yeah, absolutely. And the export uh, that, that Andy showed in terms of IMF, but, uh, but also uh, several other flavors, right, that have been added recently. Um, so yes, yeah, so we we will continue to to add more and more in terms of what we're capable of. In terms of um, a few other questions, uh, can you play back uh, from a Nexus cloud space for real time media? The answer to that is no. Cloud Spaces was really designed uh, as a way to extend Nexus and basically allow you to park workspaces in the cloud uh, for backup purposes. But you could certainly bring that workspace app back very easily. And again, it's all managed through the the uh, Nexus console. Um, can I put Nexus in my personal cloud? Today, the answer to that is no. Um, that is not available just yet, um, but it's a good idea. And uh, and thank you for, for asking the questions. Um, uh, one of the other questions was, I work in social media. Can I use Media Composer to create content for like Instagram, uh, TikTok, and Twitter? The answer to that is yes. Um, you can certainly do export of media out of Media Composer and have it be uh, basically sized properly for whatever mobile format you plan to deliver to, or same thing for any platform you plan to uh, deliver that is a social platform. So you can uh, you can basically do all the resizing you need to prior to exporting and then publish to to uh, certainly social media. 
just on that as well, Raymond, as well, as Poe points out that, that um, the MIDI composer for quite a few releases ago became kind of resolution independent. We can do 16, 16K, but equally you can go in there and create like a, rather than a 16 by nine, like a nine by 16 delivery format for TikTok. Uh, maybe all your content has been shot in uh, portrait rather than landscape. So we can create those raster sizes, bring the content in and it works exactly as that raster size would suggest. So again, you, if you've got something that is is socially orientated, then you could definitely create that. And you can you can associate you know multiple um, formats with it, with with one common project as well. Yeah, certainly, it's a great point. And as more and more folks are creating content using mobile devices, GoPros, and so on, uh, certainly we're we're uh, able to uh, not only manage all that content very easily, but export it out in a variety of different ways to make it easy to publish. So those look like the big questions that I saw. Thank you very much um, to Raymond and Andy for uh, running through your presentations. Thank you very much for everybody attended. I see there's a few um, uh, Australian uh, attendees as well. Thank you guys for getting up uh, earlier in your morning um, and joining in. It's, it's great to see some familiar names in that list. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be in a position to all catch up uh, in trade shows and uh, around the coffee sometime soon. But in the meantime, thank you very much, uh, Ray and Shauna in the background for facilitating um, uh, this, this webinar. And once again, if there's any follow-up information, feel free for, to uh, get in touch. Yes, thank you, Richard. And thank you, Adam Eyes, for having Abbott today. Thank you, thank guys. You. Thank you. Cheers, Raymond. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Shauna.